Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear friends of the Alliance of Civilizations. Over the course of the last two days, we of course have talked a lot about the dialogue of civilizations, but the Alliance, as many of you know, has historically been focused on finding ways to mitigate tensions between and promote dialogue among the Western world, the predominantly Christian Western world, and the predominantly Muslim world. So that if there is some criticism to be leveled today, the Alliance of Civilizations, it is perhaps that it was conceived as a vehicle that is focused on precisely that, on promoting dialogue between the West and the Islamic world. And perhaps many of you would argue this is fully understandable since the Alliance and before it, the dialogue of civilizations was created as a vehicle to mitigate these tensions that arose certainly in the wake of those dramatic events in the United States on 9-11-2001. But the alliance cannot be reduced to a simple dichotomy between the Islamic world and the West. Our planet is of course much, much larger than that. So today it is a particular privilege, I would even say a treat, to have with us someone who I'm sure will be a breath of fresh air, someone who will fill a gap and someone who will hopefully maybe deconstruct for us this dichotomy by bringing into our debate the other half, if not the other half, then certainly a major part of our humanity. It is my distinct privilege to introduce Professor Tu Wai Ming, who is not new to the Alliance. In fact, his association with the Alliance even predates the Alliance. Uh, he was appointed by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan back in 2001 as a small as a member of a small group of eminent personalities whose recommendations and ideas formed the basis of what was later to become the Dialogue and the Alliance of Civilizations. Professor Tu Wai Ming's illustrious academic career straddles two worlds, in fact, two powerhouses, the United States and China. He is a historian, a philosopher, an ethicist, and what is known as a new Confucian. He teaches at Beijing University, at Harvard University. He's also taught at Princeton, at Berkeley, the University of Paris, and I think, Professor, I'll stop here as the list goes on and on and on. Professor Wai Ming received his PhD in History and East Asian Languages at Harvard in uh, 1968. And frankly, I just simply don't know how he does it. He's also the author of well over 30 books and numerous scholarly articles, and I would be tempted to ask him, first off, how he does it, how he manages, and how much or how little sleep he requires. But as we continue to ponder this question, I want to invite Professor Tu Wai Ming to deliver his keynote address. I just want to let everyone know that we will then be hearing from our respondents, Mr. Candido Mendes de Almeida, professor from Brazil, a leading academic, a goodwill ambassador as well for the Alliance of Civilizations and a member of the Alliance's high-level group. And with us as well, Professor Vitali Naumkin of Russia, who is also ambassador for the Alliance of Civilizations and a member of that high-level group, whose report to the Secretary General in 2007 formed the basis of much of what the Alliance does. Professor Tu Wai Ming, though, we begin with you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for a very uh, generous introduction, uh, Ms. Fahiri. I should begin by addressing uh, your excellencies, your eminences, and by thanking the various leaders of the UN Alliance, of course, uh, Australia, uh, Austria and uh, the city of Vienna. But with your permission, um, I simply want to address exclusively all of us as uh, fellow participants at uh, uh, the fifth uh, global forum of the UN Alliance of, of Civilizations. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, very pleased and honored to have this uh, exceptionally rare opportunity to share my personal observation to uh, such an important and significant audience in such an elegant ambiance at such a critical moment in uh, human history. 
I decided to offer the personal but not private observation rather than reading a prepared text. Um, it is an, an observation from my heart as well as my mind, but uh, it is intended to be publicly accountable, therefore discussable, debatable, and obviously falsifiable. In short, I would like to offer an idea that is uh, a considered opinion of mine, particularly pertinent to making up, uh, making sense of uh, the intercultural dialogue in our age. I would like to introduce two words, spiritual humanism. By spiritual humanism, I do not mean to suggest an ideology, a doctrine, or a philosophical system, but a vision, a sense of mission, a value orientation, and a life that uh, underscores what may be called the global significance of concrete humanity. I would like to begin with a simple observation that uh, we, this particular generation, may be the very first in the evolution of human species that with our naked eye, with the help of course, the vision of the astronaut, we can see our globe, our Earth, the blue planet, in its entirety. And uh, we realize that the mineral, soil, plantation, water, and air of this blue planet of ours is all vulnerable. And we immediately associate our life situation, the human condition, the viability of the human species as a situation in lifeboat we have a sense of togetherness. We have a sense that we are all integral part of a global village. And unfortunately, we are also critically aware our lifeboat is leaking. It's a complex structure. There are many of us on the upper step, upper deck, but there are also people suffering down below. And with this critical awareness, our business is to forge a new pluralistic order, one that preserves stability and cohesion within and among societies and a rule-based international system amid increasing diversity of cultures, ideologies, and worldviews. I think a historical note is in order. We are all beneficiaries, and I may even add victims, of a global process that first began in the 18th century in France, Germany, and England, the Enlightenment movement, a culture, a culture movement, a mentality, and also some scholars like Habermas would say a project that is yet to be completed. And we, not only from the academic point of view, but from the intellectual world at large, characterized this as westernization earlier. Later in the 60s, we coined the idea of modernization. Recently, we used the term globalization. It can very well be considered as the same process with different intensity and complexity. Arguably, the most consequential spiritual, intellectual, and material ideologies in human history may have been this enlightenment. Capitalism and socialism derived from it. Market economy, democratic polity, civil society, the military industrial complex, multinational corporations and modern universities, 
or with outcomes of this incredibly significant and complex process. More important for us are the values embedded in the Enlightenment, such as rationality. Uh, Max Weber, as many of you know, characterizes modernization as rationalization. Therefore, in the modernizing process, experts and managers become increasingly important in shaping and managing our world. But other values such as liberty, equality, due process of law, human rights, particularly human rights, but also the dignity of the individual. In our collective tradition, rather than traditional culture, in our collective tradition, either in terms of traditional cultures, any kind that we see fit, or major religious traditions, this legacy rooms particularly significant. We are, in a way, still very much overwhelmed by Enlightenment thinking. But we know for sure, especially in the last 50 years, there have been negative consequences of this process. It's not rationality in terms of uh, human wisdom, knowing thyself, but it's rationality which is often turned instrumental rationality. It's a knowledge not simply to en enhance our self-understanding, but knowledge to conquer, the Faustian drive to conquer the world a kind of anthropocentrism, the belief that a human alone has all the, not just the will, but power and method to shape the universe. It's male-oriented, as many feminists have pointed out. It puts a lot of emphasis on wealth and power. It's a kind of social Darwinism that eventually leads human competitiveness, uh, competitiveness into imperialism and colonialism. And of course, it's uh, geographically, basically, Eurocentered. And it is, things, in this sense, some of the most brilliant minds in the West in the last uh, half a century have been thinking critically how not to deconstruct, but to, how to enrich, to broaden, and to deepen this process to underscore the positive values I just pointed out, but also to totally overcome some of the negative consequences. Great movements such as feminism, ecological consciousness, more recently communitarianism, the emphasis on religious pluralism and on cultural diversity. Let's take the example of China. China broadly defined, culture China has been very much overwhelmed by the Enlightenment. Right now, one of the most powerful forces in shaping China is a kind of scientism, not scientific spirit, a scientism, overwhelmed by a kind of technocracy. And it's developmentalism, it's economism, it's materialism, it's the believe that the market economy that will lead to the enhancement of wealth and power is fiercely competitive. Ever since the Opium War of 1839, China has been traumatized. So from, 18, uh, from 1839 to 1949, in that 10, 110 years, every 10-year period, there was a major rupture, change of Chinese society. After the founding of the People's Repub uh, Republic in 1949, until the reform and opening period of 1979, every five-year period, there's a major rupture, change in Chinese society. The Korean War, the Great Leap Forward, the uh, disastrous after the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and so forth. Even from 1979 until now, in the 30 or, year, 30 or so years, China still went through many, many very serious problems, ruptures. Therefore, a powerful and urgent need for a new cultural identity. My wishful thinking, of course, that the identity will be open, pluralistic, self-reflexive, ecumenical. 
And China will really have to learn to understand her own history with a view to the future as an integral part of the global community. In a rather blunt, maybe a simplistic way, I think China will have to learn how to become, in the European sense, an economic man. The definition of an economic man is a rational animal, acutely aware of his or her self-interest, seeks to maximize his or her profit in a relatively free market adjudicated by law. So such a person embodies what I just outlined, some of the great uh, enlightenment values. Rationality, of course, including instrumental rationality. Equality. Human rights. Dignity of the individual. Freedom. And uh, due process of law. So China will have to learn to be rational by overcoming China's perceived and sometimes felt narrow nationalistic sentiments. China will have to embrace human rights. China has signed all the declarations of human rights since 1948. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion. And China will have to learn again the importance of equality. The co-efficiency problem in China 4.5 is ranked, uh, unfortunately, number four, even more serious than the United States. And most of all, China will have to learn the rule of law, not simply rule by law. And yet we know in the 21st century, if China is able to learn all these values, which is painfully difficult to be sure, it is not enough for China to be a flourishing community in the 21st century. As the feminists, the ecologists, the communitarianists, the religious pluralists, and of course people who underscore the importance of cultural diversity have noted, China is confronted with the question of aging, how to deal with youth, how to handle migration, Internal migration. We talk about migration in the world, but you, th you see in China for the last 20 years, the internal migration is numbered to about 200 million. Again, unprecedented in human history. And how to deal with the mass media, how to underscore the importance of the domestic question of uh, identity politics, of religion, how to appreciate religion. How do you understand Tibet, Uyghur, as an integral part of Chinese culture? And how to develop a sense of trust among the Chinese people? The netizens, you know, people who use the network now in China, are very suspicious of anything the government does. And this, of course, is common knowledge. Whenever there's a conflict between the rich and the poor, the rich is always wrong. When there's a conflict between the official and a, a simple civilian, the official it is always wrong. A conflict between an elite university or a mediocre institution, the mediocre institution is always right. So there's a psychology of suspicion, you say cynicism. And of course, China's image abroad also requires a great deal of rethinking to build trust, not the soft power as power, but trust as an intrinsic value. And when we look at China, especially my idea of cultural China, not just the People's Republic of China, but also include, including areas like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Chinese diaspora, and maybe all of us connected with China, neither by birth nor by marriage, but concern about China in a long-term perspective. All of us are in this together. Chinese civilization, we know as a student of Chinese culture, is noted for three very important distinctive features. It's a learning civilization. It continues to learn. And now, of course, China needs to learn even more intensely, not only from the West and Enlightenment, but learn from India, especially Indian culture, the relations between intelligentsia to its own culture. Learn from the Islamic countries. Now, learn from Africa, 
the African proverb that the earth is not a gift to us by our ancestors, but it is a treasure entrusted to us by numerous generations in the future and learned from many other countries as well. But China has always been a very tolerant society. Three teachings, Confucianism and Taoism and Buddhism coexisted for centuries. More recently, five religions, including Christianity and Islam, and there's never been, in any sense, a major religious war or conflict. These different worldviews, traditions, coexist peacefully, sometimes fruitfully. And in this sense, China is also a dialogical civilization, traditionally, with understanding that dialogue requires not only tolerance, but also the recognition of the otherness of the other. With recognition, the sense of respect, with the sense of respect, the possibility of mutual reference, mutual learning, and even the celebration of difference. Harmony requires difference. A precondition for harmony is difference. Difference is diametrically opposed to diversity. And also, China has been not only a dialogical civilization, a learning civilization, a tolerant civilization, but very ecumenical. Very early on, before the time of Confucius, the idea of Tianxia, which means all under heaven. And this idea of humanity actually embodies heaven, earth, and a myriad things. One thinker in the 11th century noted that heaven is my father, earth is my mother, and even such a small creature as I finds intimacy in the cosmos. All that fills the universe is my body. All that directs the universe is my human nature. All people are my brothers and sisters, and all things are my companions. So Earth is not a collection of objects out there. Earth is a communion of subjects, as the great ecologist Thomas Berry has noted. Therefore, this idea of the uh, of the humanities suggests that in addition to the great enlightenment values we outline, we need to have many more great values for human flourishing. It is not enough simply to have rationality, even communicative rationality. We need to have sympathy, empathy, and compassion as universal ethics. Not enough to have rationality, but we need to have compassion, sympathy, and empathy. Not enough to have freedom, we need to have a sense of justice. Not enough to have legality, we need civility. It is not a good idea for any society to become litigious. A society has to be civil. It's not enough to have rights, we need to have responsibility. The dignity of the individual and the harmonious society coexist. For China to become an economic man, in other words, to learn all the values that just outlined, including, of course, human rights, is not enough. I'll give you one example, which may be simple, hopefully not simplistic. If we exercise the discourse of human rights, assuming I'm a billionaire, you are homeless, I respect your rights. I ex respect your ability, your right to express your concern, your freedom of religion, and you respect mine. I have nothing to do with you. I don't have to give you one dollar because not in the legal or moral constraint of the human rights discourse, I owe you anything. But in a different kind of mindset, a person who is more powerful, influential, have more access to information and ideas, ought to feel obligated for a much larger human community to survive. So in this sense, human rights without responsibility, without a sense of decency, a sense of compassion, is not good enough. We need to broaden our scope from the legalistic language to the language of the heart.
as well. And I would, because of the time constraint, I would simply conclude that in a world today when half of humanity is religious and the other half not, among the religionists, the, by far the most comprehensive and important is the Christian tradition involving Catholicism 1.2 billion, Protestantism and Eastern Orthodox. But the one of the fastest growing religions is Islam. And of course Hinduism is not just in Hindu but also in the Southeast Asia. And Confucianism is not just in China but in East Asia, including Japan, South Korea and Vietnam. And yet in the world today, with the advent of the human's understanding of our blue planet, all religious traditions will have to develop two languages. They have to be bilingual. In the Christian tradition, there's a specific Christian language, not just Trinity, um, resurrection, immortality of the soul, God's existence, but all kinds of other very complicated features. In Buddhism, transmigration, karma, dharma, nirvana. The two languages are incommensurable. We need tolerance, we need respect and mutual reference and mutual learning. And yet in the world today, it's not possible to imagine that we wait for the kingdom of God yet to come, we can allow the world that is Caesar's world rather than God's world to pollute. We cannot afford to say we wait for the pure land, the other shore. This world is the red dust. Let the red dust be polluted. We need to be responsible global citizens. And the language of a global citizenship is a new language is the language of spiritual humanism that needs to be cultivated. And we need to cultivate this language and the language will help us to understand values, not only the great enlightenment values of liberty, rationality, due process of law, human rights, dignity of the individual, equality, but also the language of the heart, of the great spiritual traditions, of justice, of compassion, of love, of care, and of course, the idea of harmonious society. And this is the context we need to forge ahead and try to think not only individually, but communally. Thank you. Professor, <clears throat> Professor Tzu Wai Ming, thank you very much indeed for this address. You, of course, highlight many of the challenges our societies face though you do talk about our shared humanity, our global sense, despite the pitfalls, perhaps, the setbacks of our diversity in many respects. I do want a quick follow-up, though, on some of the points you touched on at the end before I turn the floor to our distinguished respondents. Quite often within the Alliance of Civilizations framework, when it comes to discussing the issue of civilizations, it is very much seen and looked at through the prism of faith and religion. Is that the way you would first and foremost define the notion of civilization or is it too simplistic? And also are we erring in the wrong direction by talking about one Christian world, one Islamic world, one Confucian world, one Buddhist world, or are there too many subgroupings within these major religious groups? Just briefly if you would. Yes. Uh, the microphone is uh, I think on your side. Actually, uh, my good friend um, Sam Huntington, when he developed that idea of the clash of civilizations, he knew, and we all know, it's a misconception. In the Islamic world, the real conflict is not Islam with any other traditions, but the overwhelming majority of peace-loving, moderate Muslims, how to deal with a tiny minority of extremists, and the extremists fuel by this very strong, sometimes justi uh, justifiable reaction to, quote, the West. So that kind of conflict is not just civilizational conflict. And also, I think that in the Christian tradition, even though many people believe that uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity are faith-based religions, 
But I think they are much more complicated than that. If you look at Pauline Christianity, Paul's vision, the three great values, love, hope, and faith. And he makes it very clear, without love, faith is not going to work. And hope is not going to be realized. So all the values that I talked about are integral part of very complex tradition. So we need to understand religion seriously. And I want to simply note for China, not just the People's Republic of China, but cultural China, how to understand religion is absolutely critical. China, I mean the cultural elite, doesn't understand America. Why? Because even though many people speak English very fluently, because 77% of Americans are religious, are Christians. And uh, maybe uh, many of them don't go to church that often. But they're Christians. So the language of meaning, the language of ultimate concern, is a language that the Chinese will have to learn. And that's true with our understanding of, say, of Russia, not to mention of the Middle Th Eastern countries. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Tu. A good time to turn, perhaps, to Professor Naumkin of Russia. Let me just briefly mention as well that you are director of the Institute of Oriental Studies, president of the International Center for Strategic and Political Studies. You are professor and chair of the Faculty of World Politics at Moscow State University. We heard from Professor Tu about his view about the current globalization trend, the trend of modernization with all of its advances and pitfalls and so on. What is the view from where you are, uh, where you usually find yourself in, in Russia? How would you look at the arguments he has put forward? That's fine, Professor. The mic. Yeah. It's okay. So, uh, with your permission, I'll make uh, several uh, uh, provocative statements very shortly. So first about whether uh, internet, uh, intercultural dialogue uh, makes sense. I think it doesn't make any sense unless it's accompanied by extremely serious dialogue within every culture, within every civilization. Because I agree with you that the main divide lies now everywhere within each culture, within Islam, within the Western world as well. Because look at uh, the debates about some issues that are concerned by some people as, uh, uh, you know, uh, indispensable human rights, part of human rights, and uh, by some other cultures, they are, and even the people within these cultures are not considered as such. For instance, if we take gay marriages or adoption laws or something like that related to this very value, or if we take uh, the Islamic civilization for instance, the issue of takfir, anathemization, and uh, many other things. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here. The, the second, the second uh, statement I'd like to make is, so I agree that it's necessary to, uh, uh, to, to, between all values, among all values mentioned, to mention, first of all, respect to minority, with a capital letter, minority in everything, minority uh, of views, minority of... Uh, certain structures, you know, religious minorities, so on and so forth. I think it's extremely important I agree with that. The, second, the third thing is uh, I respectfully disagree with the widespread notion of the so-called increasing diversity of cultures. Mm -hmm. I think this diversity is decreasing. A lot of cultures are either disappearing or under threat. So our goal should be, in my view, uh, to protect these cultures and to not to allow to turn it into source of conflict because of these globalizational pressures on different cultures. Marginalization of certain cultures and certain beliefs, it's important. And that's why this divide between the world, so-called world of faith and world of uh, atheism or whatever, you know, uh, it's important. But to what extent it is important so that also not to allow to turn it into the source of conflict which we are witnessing. We are witnessing this very deep conflict uh, related to the role of religion which is understood differently in different cultures and I think uh, I can stop here because uh, I have five minutes. So I think it's <laughs> Thank you, Professor Naumkin. This will allow us for a more interactive discussion once we hear from Professor Mendez, who I should mention as well, is president of Candido Mendez University in Brazil, president of the Rio de Janeiro Forum of Rectors, and secretary general of the Academy of Latinity, among many other 
very impressive postings as well. Uh, how do you, Professor Mendez, see the current picture when it comes to civilizations, to the competing dynamics between civilizations? I think I have to agree with the great speaker. We have been common friends with some Huntington at Harvard, and he had this mistake, I mean, to still see civilization under a Western universality, if I may say so. And that was the problem between them and the false contradiction between civilization and cultures in the Weberian Alfred, not Max, in this sense. And what I want to stress here, thanks to his marvelous hermeneutics of understanding, this is his device to face this problem, is how can we today look at postmodernity? Can we face postmodernity as it is in this moment? What are the main and more important elements of postmodernity? The first one, of course, is the extraordinary difficulty in coexisting indifference. This is what we are just starting, wars on religions. And this is something that only starting in this moment. The second one is, I'm speaking about an overall phenomenology, the regression to fundamentalism the horrifying Republican Party in the United States. Do you imagine what would happen if these people would win? I mean, and to what extent the worst of fundamentalism can be a major position in the biggest country of the world? Are we prepared to do that? Are we aware of the difference between Republicans and Democrats today? The third, of course, is the isolation syndrome. What is this clean migration? What is this kind of clean migration that's now one of the important situations in Cameron's Britain and in Merkel, Germany? I mean, what is this clean migration? And of course, this involves the three final elements involved. First, to look at this postmodernity in the ways of the hermeneutics of our great professor, can we still, and I am saying the key word, can we really be prospective oriented? I mean, can we be in this making in which exactly the Confucius position to be, to be practical minded in the creation of this situation without or after any kind of emboldening uh, ideology? And this involves, of course, the question, are we still going to be prone to the nation building process or is this gone forever? Are we keeping in this conservative? Are we conservative to the point of keeping on the nation building process in the era of globalization? And the second one, of course, is are we still bound to the Marxist Hegelian position about mediation in terms of consciousness taking? I'm speaking about a country in which the capacity of the marginals to become actors of their own will and destiny comes from a full consciousness taking process. They go out of any form of mediation seen in the old pragmatics and the old pedagogics of Marxism. But third and the worst, we, the countries of Latin America, I'm speaking about Latin America as in Africa, we have to face the permanent bondage of the colonial times within the colonialist system. I mean, the colonial times, we still are under this bondage. And we have to understand that this is something I didn't hear here yet, the crucial difference for our countries between progress, the dirty progress, and development. Uh, we have to be system-oriented in the our forms of, the, of, of growth, and that's why development is an agonistic permanent process. We can lose, we can regress, and we still are under this yoke and this general tale of progress. The idea of progress is the last, I would say, uh, uh, I would say poisonous uh, uh, gift of enlightenment. You are, uh, we are not bound to progress. We can regress, and the enlightenment gave us this un unrational capacity to be in progress. Are we prepared in this new humanism you so well mentioned to understand that we can fail, we can regress, 
and we can lose our sense of identity. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Mendez. Uh, Professor Tu, I mean, please, quick yes, response. Uh, quick response to some of the really brilliant remarks. And first, I do agree that uh, the most challenging dialogue is internal. If you look at the Chinese situation and how the various segments of culture China will be able to develop a sense of we. In other words, uh, meaning being Chinese, for example. In English, you have only one word, Chinese. But in Chinese, there are two words. One is Zhongguo Ren, which means people of China. The other one is Hua Ren, sometimes Chinese in the ethnic and in the cultural sense. So people in Taiwan are very happy to be Hua Ren in that sense, Chinese, culturally and ethnically. But they do not want to be Chinese in the political sense. They don't necessarily belong to the same political entity. That's true with uh, many Chinese in the Chinese diaspora. The other uh, question I think is a fascinating one about postmodernism or in the postmodernity. Uh, post Let's look at Japan. Let's say for 20 years, Japan has not yet been developing. So most people consider Japan as a negative case. I've been to Japan numerous times. Japan is a very happy place. The uh, happiness index is very high. Virtually there's no poverty, a poverty-stricken environment in Japan. No matter where you go, people are basically well-to-do. Even 20 years without development, Japan is still one of the richest countries in the world. Now, if we can develop a, a system that progress is not measured by GDPs. I think China now is awakened to a new reality that GDP is an index that cannot measure friendship, love, care, progr uh, progress in terms of one's uh, human flourishing. So GDP is not a very good index for human flourishing. Uh, the other one I think uh, fascinating, I, it is true that we look at increasing diversity. But the world, as we confront with, because we are now with UN, with alliance of civilizations, we're very much uh, sensitive to religious culture issues. But the overwhelming majority of the people handling world economies are not sensitive at all. The insensitivity is considered as the norm. Uh, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case of, uh, let's say, um, of the World Economic Forum, because the World Economic Forum for the last 10 or 20 years has been deeply concerned about culture and religion. But in general, people are not that sensitive. Uh, people do not even consider culture important. You know, culture is uh, externality. It's not that important in uh, economic measurement. But we do see the homogenization going on in trade, in finance, in uh, tourism and so forth. Many, many cultures are being lost. Uh, each day, languages will be lost. And from 6,000 uh, 6, languages, uh, very quickly will be reduced to about 600. And uh, Richard Rorty, a great American philosopher, once made a remark that 50 years from now, there's only one language that matters. After visit China, he said, well, perhaps two. But anyway, in any sense, this notion about losing languages. And I think I know that people in Paris worry Right. Uh, certainly people in uh, many uh, parts of China worry about the, the, the loss of uh, indigenous languages and indigenous cultures. Professor Tu, allow me th just to pick on one point you made earlier. Uh, when you talk about Japan, obviously, you mentioned the importance of uh, economic development right. for the well-being of people. Of course, China, Japan rather, isn't representative of the rest of the world. I mean, there are many parts of the world which obviously aren't lucky enough to have witnessed the kind of development, economic and financial, that Japan has. When you look at the picture as a whole, are we regressing, are we moving forward? You mentioned Samuel Huntingdon, Huntingdon your former fellow colleague from Harvard University moments ago, of course, with the famous uh, so-called clash of civilization thesis. Every few decades, it seems, are defined by one major concept. Initially, we had something called the end of history, then the clash of civilizations. I wonder where you would define the stage we're at today as global humanity. What stage are we? What are your predictions for the future? Are we regressing? Are we advancing? And if I may, 
before you answer that, if I can just quote to you something I read uh, that you mentioned back in 1978 when you gave a talk at the James Baker Institute at Rice University in Texas, in which you said, among other things, the following. You said that the notion of outdated dichotomies no longer applies. You talked about the dichotomy of the West and the rest. You said, even though one of my colleagues, Huntingdon, has developed that notion in terms of the coming clash of civilizations, or the dichotomy between local and global, the dichotomy even between traditional and modern. The reason to transcend these dichotomies is simply to show that a world defined in terms of the globalization process is infinitely more complex, intriguing, important, to use new conceptual apparatuses for appreciating them. The advent of the global village, you say, either as a virtual reality or as an authentic home, is by no means congenial to human flourishing. Even though many of us believe that globalization is a form of integration, in fact, the world compressed into an interconnected ecological, financial, commercial, trading, and electronic system has never been so divided, you say, in wealth, influence, and power. This was back in the 1970s. Do you still agree that the world is more divided than ever? Or are we moving forward? Hopefully we're moving forward. But I think uh, we're in a very delicate period of fluidity, volatility. And if you look at China again, it can move forward with incredible creative energy, with incredible sense of human flourishing. But it also can degenerate into a conflict and tension that nobody would like to see. Because conflict and tension in China will lead to not only instability in the Pacific region, but maybe in the global sense. I think, let me go back just for a few minutes of the earlier debate. When uh, Francis Fukuyama, uh, who's one of the most brilliant uh, interpreters of modern uh, political systems now, talked about the end of history, and that was collapse of um, the Soviet Union, and the euphoria that we made it. There's only one way. That's our way. The worst manifestation of that was uh, George Bush Jr.'s idea of regime change, which I, I think I agree. It's, it's a, a kind of a marriage of uh, the extreme Christian right and uh, market fundamentalism, which is not a way for human flourishing at all. Fortunately, in the new administration, we are moving out of that, that uh, situation. So when Huntington talks about the clash of civilizations, he's challenging the idea of the end of history. He's arguing that they are civilizations outside of the West. They're not going to share the same kind of way. The immediate threat from the Christian point of view, which of course it's wrongly conceived, is the threat of, of Islam. Islamic fundamentalism. But in the distant horizon, he also thinks about China, China threat, therefore the emergence of uh, so-called Confucian East Asia. But later, I think we agree precisely because the conflict is there, the imminent clash is there, then dialogue becomes absolute, uh, absolutely necessary. So since the, uh, since the turn of the century, dialogue has been very widely used, even in uh, um, you know, in political science, in uh, diplomacy. But the genuine dialogue is so rare. Let's look at the Sino-American relationship. And for the last 20 years, there have been many, many so-called dialogues on trade, on um, climate change, on the evaluation of the B, on military strategy, and now probably on uh, cyber intelligence. But these are not dialogues. The conflicts, the tensions, the negotiations, bargains, or even outright threats. So we try to initiate a dialogue which is uh, very difficult with the Beijing Foreign. I think the, uh, the uh, professor in charge of Beijing Foreign, Professor Yan Jun, is here. We say, is it possible to have a dialogue, Sino-American dialogue, on core values? In, in other words, uh, the importance of the dignity of the individual, of individualism on the one hand, and the idea of uh, a person is a central relationship, therefore human flourishing. Can these two very different conceptions be uh, reconciled? Very complica uh, complicated. But uh, it's difficult to imagine that people in the mass media, in government, in uh, business, would be willing to spend the time to talk about core values because they consider that as a waste of time. 
we have a very urgent business to do. We don't have time, like you people, academicians, you have time to talk about these things. But my sense is that if you want to use one word, we are probably entering into a dialogical civilization. It's not just a dialogue among civilizations, but a dialogical one, because that's the only, way, only one um, that, uh, that will endure. But what is the underlying uh, project for human flourishing in this dialogical civilization? It is not enough for human survival. So we're talking about human flourishing. And I, I think that is what we need to do. That's why, in addition to human rights discourse, we really need to have a discourse of dialogue, discourse of compassion, discourse of love, discourse of concern, of care. And I think um, the Fitzel Foundation, for example, in America is trying very hard to develop the idea of love. We have a commission of uh, compassion. And these so-called soft values, they are not soft. They are absolutely critical as intrinsic values for human flourishing. Professor Tu Ming, thank you very much indeed for your very valuable insights. I also want to thank Professor Namkin and Professor Mendez for responding and giving us the other side of the argument. I wish we had more time, but I think we'll have to leave this session here. Thank you all very much indeed, and thank you for being here. Let me just uh, remind everyone that there will be workshops taking place as well as the Partners Assembly that will also be taking place uh, close to this uh, Assembly Hall. So we invite you all to go there if you've got time this morning. Thank you all very much for being here and for sharing with us this intercultural dialogue. Thank you.